Good morning, this is Harley Schlanger from LaRouche Pack with your video update for April 13th, 2020. There's a lot of talk in the media and among political layers, business layers and others about the need to reopen the economy, that we have to get back to where we were, that we have to break out of the containment that's been carried out through the lockdown uh, to try to put a stop to the coronavirus. And there's a lot of back and forth on this. Uh, look, before we do something like this, we have to ask two questions. One is, do we have the coronavirus under control? And unless we take into consideration what's happening in the rest of the world, uh, it's not under control. For example, there are reports today of a, an explosion in, in Russia, an outbreak that's overwhelming hospitals in Moscow and St. Petersburg. We're also watching with a great deal of concern what's happening in India, where you have 1.3 billion people, a completely uh, overwhelmed healthcare system. In fact, in many areas, rural areas, you have no healthcare system to speak of. And then there's Africa. So on the question of do we have this situation under control, I would urge people to go to larouchepack.com and listen to Helga Zepp LaRouche's address from Saturday. April 11th, where she took up this question of what's needed to get a global health care system so we not only can defeat the coronavirus, but protect ourselves from any future pandemics. So that's the April 11th LaRouche Pack, uh, and take a look at that. Now, the other side of this, though, is what does it mean to reopen the economy? Do you really want to go back to what was considered normal? Do you have any idea that since 2001, we've had three bubbles pop. Actually, go back to 1997-98, we've had five bubbles that have been popped, each one bigger, each one facilitated by an explosion of money printing by the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve was doing this supposedly because of the economic problems, but really it was the financial problems of the, his, the whole system a systemic crisis of debt and worthless assets. And the solution from the Fed is to defend the speculators by giving them more money, more liquidity, to keep speculating, as though driving up the prices of worthless assets is somehow good for the economy. Now think about it. Most of you are intelligent enough to know that if you have a debt and you roll over the debt by taking on new debt without the means to extinguish it. How does that help? I often use the example, it's like someone who uses a credit card to pay off a mortgage. The mortgage payment you're making for the month plus the interest means you have to come up with more money the next month. And with compound interest, each day that interest grows. The problem we have right now is that the United States has many zombie corporations which means they don't make enough profits to pay the interest on their debt. And so they're going to the Federal Reserve, to the repo markets, the repurchasing markets, to trade their worthless assets to the Fed for short-term infusions of cash so they can meet their obligations, their bills, their margin calls, whatever, for 24 hours. And then they return the money plus interest and get their worthless paper back. Now the Fed is letting them uh, continue for 14 days instead of 24 hours, in some cases 43 days, and it may be permanent rollover. Now, is that a solution? All we're doing is adding to the debt. We're not adding to the productive capacity of an economy to pay off the debt. And so before we talk about the rush to reopen the economy, you have to realize that the normal system we had before the coronavirus was collapsing. As we've pointed out at LaRouche Pack, it was collapsing from the time they failed to solve the problems that led to the 2008 collapse. All that was done in 2008 was millions of people lost their homes, millions of people lost their jobs, more industry and manufacturing went overseas and offshore, and the cost to the American people was to bail out the banks. And they say, well, look, the, the Treasury and the government paid back or the banks paid back all that debt. Well, they didn't. They kept rolling it over. And the Fed 
is now sitting there with over $5 trillion of worthless assets on their books. And they're now buying everything, commercial paper, corporate debt, junk bond debt. Do you realize the Federal Reserve is injecting fresh liquidity, fresh money, in return for junk bond debt? That's your future dependent on the whether or not a junk a corporation that's issuing junk bonds can pay it off at some point in the future. Now, since September, we've had another influx of liquidity, the so-called liquidity crisis that caused the repo markets to implode and the Fed to have to jump in to keep the repo markets going. And then as the coronavirus hit and we had a lockdown of the economy in the United States, the Fed agreed to another $4 trillion plus an unlimited amount of new money for speculation. Now, that system cannot survive. And we have to go back and look at what happened in the past when you had these kinds of crises. Let me give you a couple of examples of taking Germany as a case study. In 1918, at the end of the war, or 1919, at the end of World War I, there was the Versailles Conference. And what they concluded was that Germany must pay reparations. Now, this meant that the German economy, which had been uh, pretty badly affected by World War I, was being taxed by the so-called victorious powers to pay for their debt, to pay down their debt. And this led to, in 1923, a hyperinflation in Germany. And then austerity to pay the debt from the hyperinflation. And you know the result. Germany was in chaos through the early 30s, and then through conjunction of interests of American bankers like the Harriman interests, Prescott Bush, the father of George Herbert Walker Bush, and others, through the Union Bank Corporation, joined other international bankers to fund Hitler and put Hitler in power as a means of debt collection. And we had World War II. Now, after World War II, Germany was bombed back into the Stone Age almost, and had a large debt. But there was a conference in London in 1953 which forgave Germany its war debt. And then Germany was able to generate new credit through the Credit Anstalt für Wiederaufbau, the Bank for Reconstruction. And the result was the German economic miracle. Now, which path do we want? The Versailles path? or the London Conference of 1953, which allowed for Germany to become one of the strongest economies in the world. Now you look again in 1982, when Mexico had an unsustainable debt. And Lyndon LaRouche traveled and met with the president of Mexico, Jose Lopez Portillo, and laid out something called Operation Juarez. But importantly, he proposed a debt bomb. Because what he said is, what happens when you have countries that can't pay the debt and yet they're told by the International Monetary Fund and the international bankers, if you don't pay the debt, you get no new credit. They have only one weapon, which is to jointly declare a debt moratorium. LaRouche called this the debt bomb. This became one of the leading discussion points in 1982-83. But instead, there was a doubling down in debt collection. And then there was the NAFTA agreement which temporarily provided a certain influx of money to Mexico at the expense of American workers and American industry, but ultimately drove down the wages in Mexico. So again, there was no solution to the debt. After 2008, no solution to the debt problem. Today, no solution to the debt problem, just more debt being created by bailing out speculators. So this is where you have to look at why an infrastructure plan is, is worthwhile, why the LaRouche Four Laws would work. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details on these. You have to re-regulate banking. You need a credit system and investment in platforms of infrastructure. And what does that do? Well, if you modernize infrastructure, you're creating new jobs directly in the building of the infrastructure. But it goes all the way down the supply chain. You need new equipment, whether it's construction equipment, transportation equipment. You need, you have parts and suppliers that have to provide the parts that are needed in the construction of the new machines that are involved. You also have new, new cities. You bring workers into areas. Uh, you need infrastructure for them. So you have multiplier effects in producing something real and necessary, not bailing out speculative bubbles.
So when you do the bill of materials for an infrastructure project, and then you look at the question of do we just want to rebuild the old infrastructure or do we want to make it the most modern infrastructure in the world? Then you're talking about research and development in science. You're talking about needing to train new scientists, new technical experts, engineers, uh, design experts, construction capabilities. And in these days, 3D printing, uh, artificial intelligence, and so on. So you're talking about a whole new economy that can be built and that will pay for itself by increasing the productivity of the whole economy. That's what we need to do. When we talk about going back to work, we should not go back to where we were in September of 2019 or January of 2020, where the Federal Reserve is producing hyperinflationary volumes of liquidity to bail out bankrupt uh, shadow banking systems and hedge funds. Instead, we need new physical economy, and that means the ideas of Lyndon LaRouche. That's why we're going to have a conference April 25th and 26th, which you can register for on the LaRouchePact.com website, so you can be engaged in a discussion online uh, to discuss exactly how these policies will work. So thank you for joining me today, and I'll see you again tomorrow.